she's here today to talk about trauma and assessment. Um, don't miss the iceberg. Mm -hmm. And uh, without further ado, I'll introduce Kay. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for coming out. It's cold outside. Some kids are off from school, so I'm happy to see those that were able to come out. Um, I'm really honored to be selected to speak on a topic that I really care a lot about. Um, and I've had a lot of uh, experience working in. Um, I wanted to just explain um, why I use the iceberg uh, metaphor here. Um, I think it's pretty obvious if we think about what trauma is. Um, I'm a very visual person, and so I tend to use a lot of metaphors in my clinical work, as I'm sure we all do, especially when you're working with children. You really have to drive the point home, so we use a lot of metaphors. We try to reference things that they'll understand. But as clinicians, I think we could use them too. They're very beneficial for us too. And um, I like the iceberg for a number of reasons. This image kind of expresses what it's like for us when we're sort of interfacing with a, a client um, or one of our consumers. And um, the other reason why I like it is because it reminds me a lot of the movie Titanic, which was a favorite movie of mine way back. And if it's on TV, I'll watch it no matter what's going on. It's a long movie, but I'll watch it no matter when, when I turn to it, where it is in the movie. And um, I really love um, historical fiction and biopics. And I always cross-reference when I see a movie, well, how much of that was true and how much of it did they make up? And one of the things that I was fascinated by in Titanic is that it appears that um, they just barely cleared, they could have cleared the iceberg if they had seen it just a couple of seconds later. Um, and so I went back and I would read and find out how true is that? Is that true that that ship actually didn't have to sink? Um, and it's actually true. Um, part of the reason why the ship um, really went down is not so much that they hit it, but where they hit the iceberg. And they really underestimated the, the size of it underneath the water. They were so focused on what they saw that they thought they had enough time to clear it. And they actually did not clear it underneath. And so they hit on the mass underneath at just the sweet spot where the bottom fills with water. And then we know the rest. If you've seen the movie, you've seen how a ship that mass have just pretty much broken half. Um, and there's all kinds of, you know, conspiracy theories about, well, if they had hit it dead on and blasted right through, would they have made it? Um, you know, all these different theories. But I like to think about that because it's true for us as clinicians. Um, we have an opportunity as soon as we meet a client to see what they're showing us but really try to be considering what they're not showing us. What is it that we don't see? Because it's the things that we don't see that sometimes um, create a crash and burn situation in our clinical work. Um, and maybe they don't want to come back or maybe we lose that alliance because we just missed something that we didn't ask about. So it's just about asking the right questions. And a lot of the stuff I hope is just reinforcing what you already know. But I just wanted to kind of explain why I like the iceberg um, analogy and how I really try to look at my clients when they come in because I still work with um, children in my clinical practice. I still work with children that have PTSD. Um, so that's kind of just my little intro as to why I chose this um, iceberg analogy. So um, I have goals and objectives. Um, these are pretty standard. I know at UVHC we always have to turn these in if we're doing a presentation. So I do have them, but um, I don't want to read it to you. But basically what I want to talk about today is just the value of approaching our work. Um, with our children, consumers, and I, I like the idea of um, thinking about our kids. We, we service them. They're still our consumers, too. We're, we're serving them, and we want to do um, right by them in our due diligence and how we um, provide our service. And a lot of children that end up in community mental health settings, um, we know there's kids that are predisposed to a lot of other issues that bring them here. And we want to consider that with using a real trauma lens um, when we're approaching our work from the second we meet them. Um, so I have some objectives here, and I want to go through some things and um, hopefully have some discussion, too, because I do want to hear from all of you. So I'm going to actually work my way backwards. So we're all child-focused clinicians, but I want to start with an adult patient. So a 43-year-old woman, Anne, comes to a community mental health center for treatment. She describes being frustrated after years of various programs that she's attended to treat her bouts of depression. She has a number of other health issues, which are listed there. And during her initial eva evaluation, she's asked about, you know, the, the basic things we ask about your family history, psychiatric history, what are your current symptoms, you fill out some forms. Um, and she's taking some medication for depression. She has some an anti-anxiety meds that she takes just as an as-needed basis. No history of substance abuse. Um, she does say that her dad struggled with alcoholism. So according to what the research says, 
What is Anne least likely to be asked about directly? Any ideas? I saw somebody say it. <laughs> Pretty obvious. Trauma. So here's a problem. So this is the clinched client. So we, Anne comes in and this is she, we see what we see. We hear what she says. But the problem is really all of that. It's not just um, the top. It's not just the bottom. It's all of that. It's all around that. It's the 30,000 foot view of that. And so, unfortunately, we're only one person as a clinician. So our job really is to just get as much information as possible. And so um, sometimes we have to dig a little deeper, as they say at CPMP, when you go to the DCPMP fellows presentations, which are amazing, they always say we gotta dig a little deeper. And they always wanna drill down to see, well, what is it that we're missing that doesn't, isn't just captured by what we see? This is what we don't ask about. So when I was working in Philadelphia, um, one of the projects we were doing was disseminating evidence-based treatment for trauma to community mental health centers in the community. And um, when, by the time I got there, they had already trained their first round of clinicians in a, in a very robust treatment for um, adolescents and adults with PTSD. And after training these clinicians, we wanted to follow them and see how they were doing and you know, really support them in implementing this and um, really having sustainability in their clinics. And what was becoming really frustrating to the team was that they kept saying, we can't do the treatment because we don't have any patients to do the treatment with. We don't have any PTSD patients. We have one or two. And these were clinics with hundreds of patients that had been there for years. And when we looked back, we realized, well, the reason was because they actually were not screening for trauma. So when they were pretty much having their normal practice of patients coming in, um, you know, saying, I'm depressed or I have this or that, and they were treating whatever the patient said they needed treatment for but they at no point in time were screening for trauma in any direct way. And so um, Dr. Foa, um, who it was my boss, said, we need to find out why this is happening. Can you do some research about, is this, is this normal? Is this a Philadelphia thing? Um, and I did some work around this, and we needed the work to justify why we needed to do more training on screening. And so the findings are pretty consistent with what I just said, that um, not just in Philadelphia, but all over the place, particularly with community mental health clinics, trauma is the least likely um, symptom to be screened for. Trauma symptoms, PTSD is also least likely to have a formal screening, although we do give things like depression scales, we do ask about anxiety, we typically don't ask about trauma, and when we do, we only really focus on sexual trauma. Um, so that's one of some, some of the findings, but also some um, the clinics talked about how they don't really ask because they don't know what to do if the client endorses it, either they don't have clinicians there that can treat trauma, if that's the primary issue, um, or they don't have a, a good screening tool for it. You kind of just ask, have you ever experienced a trauma? And you go by sort of the DSM clinical trauma with a big T, and if it doesn't fit in that category, you can make it maybe a secondary diagnosis, which means the primary will get more attention. So you have the lack of providers, um, and then you have underreporting, so people are just less likely to report trauma. So um, that kind of creates a real storm there of where you might be treating symptoms of a deeper problem, which may result in maybe short-term outcomes that are good, but you might see these patients looping back into treatment, it becomes kind of a revolving door. And so um, that's another concern that comes out of this research. So that's what we don't ask. Um, so if we're not likely to ask, and our consumers are not likely to reveal it to us, then a lot of things could happen. And adults with many serious mental health challenges, like depression, um, if you go back, a lot of research is saying, well, these are people that are actually likely to have had suffered from maltreatment and neglect as a child. And these are two items that are not considered clinical traumas with a big T, according to the DSM. And so we don't always ask about um, whether or not a person has ever been involved in child welfare, um, if their parents have, whatever the case may be. So, am I going too fast? Everything's yeah. making sense? Yeah. So here's some more research about what happens to untreated trauma. Um, so research shows, as I said, PTSD is one of the least assessed, at least reported, and um, at least treated mental health conditions. And um, I won't reveal the name, but anecdotally, um, in, the, in the community mental health center I was doing my postdoc in, I remember asking one of the psychiatrists, you know, you have 800 patients here and only about 
50 have a primary diagnosis of PTSD, and we're in Philadelphia, and you've had some of these patients since 1970-something. It's a very old clinic. And um, she said, well, we, get, we can't really medicate PTSD, but we can give people medication for these other things. So I, she said, I can't speak for my colleagues, but she said, I tend to put it as a secondary diagnosis because I know I can get them some quick relief if I can focus on more on the depression or the mood disorder. Now, some of our colleagues obviously agree, disagree with that, but that's just, you know, it kind of captures what might be some of the underlying issues as, as to why these folks are not getting what they need. Um, as you know, PTSD and trauma exposure, chronic trauma exposure, um, there's a high comorbidity with substance abuse, and a lot of that has to do with the, the, the medicating the pain from um, trauma. Um, and also, there's the medical illnesses. And the ACE study is a big one. I don't know if people are familiar with the ACE study, but it's um, the Average Childhood Experiences study. It was a very large study that was done. And it really just asked questions about exposure to abuse and household dys dysfunction as a child. And um, these individuals that um, endorsed um, one or more, they had higher risk factors for other um, medical illnesses as adults that could lead to death, hypertension, diabetes, those kinds of things, substance abuse, um, and our youth. Right? So youth in the juvenile justice system, they're about eight times more likely to have had multiple traumas, not just one, but four or more uh, multiple traumas. And so really the prison system is our biggest mental health institution. Um, people that are in um, our juvenile justice um, systems have mo most likely are suffering from exposure to trauma and, and may even have high rate, higher rates of PTSD. So why don't we ask about trauma? <clears throat> I don't want anyone to put themselves on the spot. I'm not saying if you answer it that you don't ask, but I think it's just good to, so I'm saying we, the collective we, me, you, us. Um, so why don't folks ask about trauma? Um, you know, I, 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 I teach social work, and one of the things that um, I teach about is doing an interview, an initial interview, and I think one of the things that students describe is that they're worried about um, they feel like those questions are very personal, mm -hmm. even though we're asking lots of other personal questions. And they're worried about how to word it in a way that's sort of sensitive and respects the person's maybe discomfort with discussing it. And that actually when we talk about ways to word those questions and ways to be sensitive, they actually feel more comfortable. Right. So I feel like in some ways it's related to that, sort of not knowing how to say it and what to do with the information and how to do it in a way that's sensitive to people. Right, right. And I think that um, sometimes people don't ask the questions when they're really afraid of the answers. Mm -hmm. So again, that feeling mm -hmm. of just not knowing of, you know, what am I going to do with this when this comes out? Right. You know, and that fear of re-traumatizing an individual, having to recount something that mm -hmm. was so traumatic event to begin with. Yeah. That's, a, that's also really big. Mm -hmm. so we, I don't want to re-traumatize them. Mm -hmm. They won't come back. They'll cry. You know. That was a big one with the centers in Philadelphia. They just did not, they were afraid of um, causing like sort of a Pandora's box to open in the mm -hmm. first initial meeting and then you don't know how to kind of get it back together. Especially if you have no training in it, you don't know what to do. Yeah. Um, so, was, we, anybody else? Oh, sorry. I was gonna say maybe they're afraid of having to make a DCPMP call like the first That's a big one. Mm -hmm. yeah. And for my work, we primarily do like family counseling. So sometimes, if you have a family in the room, you don't know if the caregiver wants to disclose certain traumas or maybe the youth. So I mean, right. sometimes when we assess, we especially the first session, we try to split that up sometimes and meet with the youth individually and maybe the parents or the caregiver separately right. as well. Mm -hmm. So what do we ask about? Probably everything else. We ask a lot of other things. Um, what, so what are the things we ask about maybe if we're trying to get to see what's going on, but we're not quite going to push it? So think about things you ask your families about, the parents. What do you ask them? You would ask if there's already been involvement. Right, asking about involvement already in child welfare. And, and, this, and the third question I think you kind of hit on is about the best way to ask is just to ask. I think we do a couple things. Um, you know, my experience is, and I've done so many sc trauma screenings, um, because that was my job pretty much, um, is that sometimes when you ask, um, it actually relieves people because, um, one, if you have a measure, first of all, that's a, that's a big relief because it's like, well, they created something, so I'm not the only person that 
has this issue. So I think it normalizes it. But if we're not scared to just say the word sexual assault, you know, not like aggressively, but have you ever, you know, you know if, we're, if we're okay with saying, have you ever experienced any physical abuse or have you ever um, felt threatened at home or whatever the question is, and we kind of just say it just like we would ask, you know, so what brings you in today or, you know, it, if it's just part of the conversation and it's not like, okay, now we're going to talk about trauma. Um, and you go, it just kind of normalizes it and it makes it seem like you're not afraid to ask. So that might also make them less afraid to talk about it. Now again, I'm talking about sort of still, we're still at Anne at 43, right? I'm gonna get back to our kids. Um, but the other thing that's really important is everyone in our programs have basic awareness of trauma. And the fact that many people coming through the front door may have a trauma history. Who, who knows that? Does, the, does your front desk staff know that? Do they understand um, what that means? Um, we know when people have experienced chronic trauma, it's a lot of chaos, it's a lot of unpredictability and a lack of safety. So do our programs create that? And I'll talk a little bit about that more um, as we're moving ahead. So, so based on Anne's presentation, it's pretty likely that she, she has all those medical issues, she has a father with a substance abuse history, she herself has suffered from depression chronically throughout her life. If we want to go back now to, now Anne walks into one of our programs. And she's with her mom because she's 10. Um, so ten year, uh, mom comes in with 10-year-old daughter, Anne, because she um, has been having some difficulty at school. She's isolating herself from friends, staying in her room all the time at home. Mom says that Anne doesn't like her new partner, mom's new partner. Mm -hmm. Even though he's a family friend, she's known for a while. So this is the presentation. These are kids we see all the time, right? Like they're, they're kids that have just random behavioral disturbances. Um, and so the Anne at 43, we might meet her. We might already have Anne in our office right now. So, um, so what I want to make the point is, is that with the children you work with right now, we're holding the kids that might be in the adult division later. And I think we have to look at our kids in that way and really hold that um, close because, you know, I think about sometimes these, these kids that go on and do, you know, we hear about it in the news, they, they're shooting in schools, they're, you know, um, doing all kinds of things. And I think to myself, like, how many mental health clinicians did that person? I always, like, don't let that be me. I don't want to be the one that 10 years from now, like, I had little Bobby, and he was in my, you know, at my practice, and, and he was 10, and I just let, let it slip away or whatever it is. Now, we can't guard for all of that, but we have to think about that, that these, the kids we have now, in the event that there is a trauma that we're not addressing or there's exposure to um, any other sort of um, kind of chronic stressors, early on, if we can capture that early on and really work on it, we could really mitigate the long-term impacts. So we have a, a real opportunity being that we're child clinicians. It's a wonderful opportunity, but um, we gotta take it, to, this is serious, this is very serious. And I think um, I've read in some places that PTSD is one of the biggest public health issues that nobody knows about. So we have to think about that. Um, let's, get, let's get to them before they get full-blown PTSD. Um, so now I want to move into um, sort of the screening aspect of it and what trauma-informed care is. You know, it's a buzz term. It's a lot of it. Is, I, I can't wait for the day we're not even calling it trauma-informed care. It's just care. It's just how we do the work. Because <laughs> I feel like it's like a special word, and it really is just good, good clinical practice. Um, so it really starts at the beginning. The first phone call. <coughs> the first walk-in, the first encounter, and everyone thereafter. Because guess what? You know, I was talking to someone last week, um, we did internship interviews, and one of the interns said, kids have a sixth sense. They know if you don't like them. They know if you don't like their parent. They know, they know if you're fake, basically, and we know that. So um, we want to really genuinely create um, an environment that facilitates them wanting to share with us. Because you're right, it is, like you said, it's really hard if they, if they're scared to share because we have to make a call or whatever it is. So <coughs> we wanna create that safety, that structure, that acceptance. Um, the way we talk about our kids in our clinical meetings, um, the way we talk about our kids when we're just kind of talking about the work, yeah, the work is hard, but that bleeds into how you interact with the kid. I always hate when I hear clinicians talk so badly about their families they work with. You know, it really gets to me because that shows up when you're in the room. So. We have to have like a genuine ability to kind of see somewhere where we can really 
appreciate something this person and this family has to offer. Um, so trauma-informed care is all that stuff that starts in the kind of the environment we create and really recognizing the importance of universal screening for trauma um, and, that, and that the agency really dedicates time to this. So things like this. I think um, the investment that DCPMP has made in really wanting to understand trauma is a big deal. It's a very large system. And so if they can do it, I think everyone can do it because that's, that's a big Titanic ship to move around. So um, they're trying to avoid that iceberg and really try to get to what's underneath. Um, so it really want, we really want to be sensitive, not just to the children, but to the caregivers, because they're the ones that get the kids there. Um, so we want the caregivers to be involved. Um, so it's all about how, how can we create that environment where they even want to talk to us, because that's the step before screening, that they feel comfortable enough to, sh to share, right? So I'm preaching to the choir. I hope you all know that already. Um, okay, so again, remember what's what we see and versus what they say. So when they come in, this is what we tend to hear. Um, ADHD concerns, right? Disruptive behaviors, externalizing behaviors, school refusal, avoidance, anxiety. Um, kids will have extreme fears that seemingly unrelated to any trauma, but um, they're afraid of lots of different social situations and so on. Um, and then the caregivers are going to report, um, you know, feeling a loss of control over their child, maybe feeling like they can't manage their child's behaviors, maybe they don't have enough support from people around them. So screening the child and maybe even the caregiver for trauma is essential. Now, if the, the caregiver is not our patient, you know, if the child is our patient or our client, then, um, you know, we can't just say, hey, mom, can you fill out this measure for trauma? But in our informal assessment of the child, sort of understanding the whole child, we can get some information that I think is really helpful. So this is, screening for trauma just means we get an opportunity early on. So, so going back to the work I was doing in Philadelphia, same clinic with 800 or so patients, we went in and did a full battery of assessment. So we did a PTSD screen, we screened for resilience, we screened for depression, um, uh, prolonged grief disorder, um, a couple of different things. And um, so 800 people. So remember I said out of 800, they had 50 people that had a PTSD diagnosis. You go back to all that data, so after doing about, um, out of those 800, I think we made it to about 600 plus people to do this, the, the battery. Out of those, about 30% showed up with PTSD, full-blown PTSD. And so 30% of that, I'm not going to do the math because I'm going to embarrass myself, but it was a lot more than 50. Um, and then you had some people that had high exposure to trauma, but because they also had high scores and resilience, it kind of allowed for them, it protected them. So that's good information too because if we know what strengths or protective factors a child has, we could actually probably protect them from um, falling into the, a pattern of P chronic PTSD um, symptoms and um, behaviors and responses. Um, so informal versus formal screening and assessment. So this is the things, the formal screening I think is more of those measures that we might give. Um, but informal is all the work we do um, you know, in that initial interview evaluation really want to include the caregiver, um, and really have a trauma-informed approach to capture the whole child. Does anybody already use any trauma screenings when they do their intakes with kids? We have this uh, strength and needs assessment that we use, and there are bubbles you're supposed to ask follow-up questions, but if there's any sort of trauma indicated, there's like a whole separate module that kind of really zeroes in on it. Right. Mm -hmm. In my previous job, we had to use the UCLA and the TSCC. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, so I, I'm going to have some um, slides where I just have a ton of um, measures, um, and they're going to be available, I guess. Um, I thought we would have these printed out for you all, but there'll be, there'll be some um, on the website, I think, that these are going to be available at some point later today, sometime. But I have a ton of uh, screeners. Some are free. You can print them off Google. They're very easy. Because for clinical re purposes, you're just trying to get information, so it's not like you have to have this really fancy, you know, expensive instrument. You just want information, you know, you want to be capturing that and maybe tracking that over the course of your treatment to see that they're getting better. You know, the one thing I want to go back to on the um, informal front, so in this slide I actually had my little iceberg, there was a man on top with like chipping away at the iceberg from the top and underneath on the iceberg there's all these words like fear, sadness, um, uh, hopelessness and all these things underneath and you know he's just chipping away. Um, so we have to kind of um, see ourselves as kind of digging 
digging, trying to get as deep as we can up front, it really cuts the workout because how many of you have been in treatment with a, a, a child and you keep hitting like a wall, like, you know, the, or the parent, they won't come in, they won't, you know, you, you keep hitting that wall. So I think doing a really good assessment up front allows you to kind of see the whole picture and you can then start zeroing in on your biggest problem areas and get a lot more bang for your buck up front um, and deal with the issues that are um, driving maybe what the symptoms look like on the top. We really have to get away from just focusing on what they say is the problem. Yes, that's the problem. But if we look a little further, maybe there's some things underneath there that if we clear that out of the way, it actually lifts all these other things. When you treat trauma and PTSD, depression often lifts. You don't even, you, depression is kind of part of that. So um, we can't really be so kind of tunnel vision in our clinical work. Um, so really we want to get at the underlying issues um, and we want to be able to clear that because we, we know that that can impact not only the treatment plan but the therapeutic alliance. If you don't have the parent on your side, I mean, what can you really do? Um, there, you, you know, I, I always say, you know, you're with a patient maybe for like an hour and the other 160 some hours, they're with everybody else. So if you don't have those people on your team, then, and they're not going to follow through on what you're saying, yeah, this really works and I really need your help on this, um, you know, you're kind of lost. You know, you're just kind of dealing with the crisis of the week, basically. Um, so informal assessment's really important. So these are just some things that I think are really important to ask that hopefully we all do, but I think it's, you know, seeing that in the context of how you could get at some trauma issues maybe underneath, or even some instability at home. And, and trauma doesn't have to be this, like, big accident, uh, fire, you know, whatever. It's community violence, exposure to community violence on a regular basis. That's traumatic for our young kids. Um, so where do they live? Tell me about your neighborhood. What, did it, what does your kid do? Like, who lives around you? Um, Who's in the immediate circle? You know, if we go back to like a Brock and Brenner, this is psychology way back with the systems, the ecosystems, and um, you know, you have this child, and then there's all, all these people in the inner circle. So who's in the inner circle of the child? And I think this is an interesting question that you can ask kids separately from their parents, because it's different. Kids will say something very different about who they think are their, you know, number one people in their life around them. They might say people that are totally different than what the, the mom or dad might say. So it's good to have both of that, um, both of those pieces of information, because we want to have a sense of who does this kid trust, and who can this, who can I kind of bring in that is going to be on my team to help this kid um, do well and be successful. Um, and I think it's important. We're not doctors, you know, except um, our psychiatrists in the room um, are doctors. But we're, we're not, you know, we don't know all about all the biology of, you know, prenatal development. But I think we know enough to know that um, if a mom is extremely stressed and surrounded by a lot of violence and, and, and things like that during pregnancy, you know, that has an impact on her and um, her unborn child and then, you know, maybe even her ability to parent early on. Um, what was her, the birth like? You know, was it a stressful delivery? Were you, were you knocked out unconscious? Did you have to have surgery and you weren't with your child for a few, you know, days or weeks? Was your child born early and was in the NICU for, you know, these are just good things to know about early development. Um, this is a growing issue because we know more and more about neurobiology and early exposure to trauma. Um, and a lot of great people are talking about that early um, traumatic in, trauma impact on the brain and development. Also, um, do you ask your parents about how their kids play? Um, you know, sometimes kids reenact things and play. My kid's um, daycare teacher always says, parents, when they go into the family center where the kitchen is, little kitchen areas, they're doing what you do at home, so be mindful <laughs> that they're reliving at school. <laughs> you know, so they know probably all our business <laughs> at the school um, because our kids play, especially the little, little ones, they play with what, how they know. So they kind of reenact things that they see. Um, so this is just good to know. I would ask, I ask these questions all the time for the parents I work with because I want to know, did you notice any changes in their play? Is it more violent? Is it, you know, what are, what are some things you notice? Um, are they not playing at all? Are they not playing with the same pe friends they used to play with or whatever, um, whatever it might be? Um, so that's the digging a little deeper. Um, and then is there a sense that the parent has um, their own trauma history? I think this is good to just ask outright. I mean, I'm a very direct person, so 
I'm probably, I, I haven't, I, at least I don't know that I've offended any person, but I tend to just ask it very directly because I think it's just, this is part of it. So when you go to your own doctor, doesn't your doctor get all in your business, ask you all kinds of questions mm -hmm. about, like, they just, they touch you, they do it, whatever they want to do. We don't even question them. We don't question them. So why are we as mental health clinicians <coughs> afraid to ask about the thing they're here to get help for? Mm -hmm. We have to kind of get over that. Um, our job is to help them, and we don't want them to keep coming back, coming back, coming back, and they're 50 years old, and they've been to 20 different clinicians since they were 15 or since they were 10. We are allowed to ask the same questions that we let our doctors ask us all the time. So we have to be willing to do that, um, especially with our parents being um, in there with us. we got to find out what's going on with them, too. Um, so instead of using the phrase, well, what's wrong with this child, we need to find out what happened. That's just good old trauma-informed care, that lens, that approach. Sandy Bloom, who does the sanctuary model, that's kind of like the mantra. It's not what's wrong with this child, not what's wrong, what's wrong with this parent? You know, why aren't they coming in? It's what happened. Maybe they couldn't get a ride. It could be something so small, but we will vilify parents sometimes because we're frustrated, and that's okay, but take a step back and rephrase the question. What happened? Something may have happened and we got to find out what it is. And then we got to find out what the family does well because we're going to use that to um, per, you know, kind of uh, leverage any intervention that we're going to use. So up front we need to know, well, what do you guys do for fun? When's the last time your family had a great time? Um, what, do, what does your kid do that you think is a real strength? we got to find those things out um, up front. Any questions so far about that? Thoughts? Still with me? I'm going to finish on time because I, I really believe in, in doing that. So I'm going to still stop on time. <laughs> can, I, can I just say, in terms of that um, the systems assessment up front, I think you're absolutely correct. And in terms of just looking for that intergenerational exposure, will give you your template and will help you. So even if you use the genogram and focusing on those um, potential areas of risk and resiliency, mm -hmm. I found very helpful. And including in that, some assumption type questioning um, will give you different responses. Families right. will let you know if you're off track mm -hmm. and relatedly for their children, and they'll let you, they'll seem surprised that somebody asked them, I found. Right. So, in terms of, you know, who else in your family, fill, you know, what else, you know, it, mm -hmm. it's, it's interesting to see that type of response versus those yes, no questions. Mm -hmm. Right, it happens so many times. I think if you're right in those assumption questions and looking at patterns that people don't really, we don't think about it like that. We don't either. So even when you're doing, um, if you're doing a formal trauma screen, like the things I'll, I'll bring up in a second, when you ask some of those questions, people say, you know what, I, do, I never would have linked that back to that though, but that's a good point. Mm -hmm. So they're not maybe making linkages. So when you ask about, you know, do you tend to be kind of overly alert of your surroundings? <clears throat> Does your child tend to be that way, very startled all the time? Like, you know, can you think about why, any, any reason why that might be? Then they start making these connections. You want the client to kind of be having these aha moments right along with you. Again, that kind of pulls them in, makes them part of the treatment. It's that collaboration that you really want. Mm -hmm. um, so, so I think you're absolutely right in really helping them to see that thread mm -hmm. and that pattern. And then they, they're kind of like, wow. It kind of brings them right over to your team, which is what you want. So I have some a lot of formal assessment screening tools. So there's great websites out there where you can get this stuff for free. So I'll, I actually bring up the slide a little later, but I'll tell you now. Um, the National Center for PTSD is one. That's the VA site. They do have adult and child measures. And to access the child measures, all you have to do is email them say, hey, I'm a clinician, I work with kids, I really want to have access to these tools, and they give them to you for free. Some of them are just self-reports that are really straightforward. Some of them are more detailed, like the CAPS. Um, but, but, you know, you have to decide what will work for you and your, and your setting. Sometimes a self-report is better, and these are self-reports you can give to kids. Um, some of them go very young, as young as seven, eight. Um, and then the other ones are for the parent to fill out, and then you to go back and, and work with them. And there's so many on the National Child Traumatic Stress Network site. If you go under resources and there's like a measures database, um, there's a ton of them. And all those are getting at the idea of a, doing a really good trauma assessment. So the trauma assessment is not just I'm looking for PTSD. It's I'm looking for exposure to trauma. 
I'm looking at um, how many traumas, and some of them do both. Um, they might look at multiple traumas and exposure. But also some of them are very broad in their definition of what ex trauma is. So it's not just the sort of standard, typical um, things that we see listed in the DSM. The thing I really liked about the change to the diagnosis for PTSD in the DSM-5 is they got rid of the one criteria that said something about have to feel a sense of hopelessness or something like that. Because when you're a child and you're exposed to trauma chronically, you, you this is your normal. This is the normal. So you may not be afraid. It's just, you know, this is something that just happens to me. So it got rid of that, um, and it added in this part about the cognitive changes and sort of affective changes that, that occur, where you might have a, a fear or, or trust issues, just like a negative view of yourself, the world, and others. Kind of added that in in addition to the other criteria. So um, as much as people talk about the DSM-5, I think they really did very well on this particular diagnosis. Um, so there's a lot of questionnaires here. I'm not going to like go through every single one because there's several slides of these. But this, for this first group is really just looking at exposure to trauma. So it's not necessarily trying to um, look for PTSD. And I just want to be um, also um, clear that a lot of us, I think something like 70% of people will have experienced a trauma in their life, but a very small percentage actually develop PTSD. So we're, a lot of times what we're dealing is um, the reaction to chronic exposure to trauma, not necessarily PTSD, especially with children. Because guess what, they can't avoid. They have to go to school, they have to do, so they're, they're not able to avoid and do things the same way an adult with PTSD would. So with our children, we just wanna see if there's exposure to trauma, period. Um, and and if, if there is, is that also interplaying in how we're, we're kind of, we're looking at it and saying this is ADHD. Well, is it ADHD? It, it might be, but we don't want to rule out that if you have a lot of, of things going on in your life that are super chaotic, I'm sorry, you're definitely going to have a hard time paying attention at school. You may have some impulse control issues if every time you hear a sound, you know, you're jumping around. That might be about something else. So again, it's just we want to try to ask as many questions as possible because we don't want to give a diagnosis that is really inaccurate. So I'm just want to put that out there. Um, so um, these next set of questionnaires, um, I like the when bad things happen scale because that's in terms that I think kids get, um, that bad things do happen. Um, and it's framed, the questions are framed in that way for the child. And a lot of these forms um, have a child and parent version. Um, there's not many out there for very, very young children, um, so I don't know the ages of all the folks that you all see. A lot of them are for the school age and up, maybe seven. A lot of them have that basal um, age of seven. And some are just for adolescents. The, uh, the UCLA one that was mentioned, that's a really good one. A lot of people um, use that one. Um, I don't know if it's been updated for the DSM-5. Has it been updated yet? The CAPS has been updated too for the, um, the DSM-5. So I think a lot of these um, questionnaires are catching up if they're looking at both exposure and um, <coughs> symptoms for PTSD. Um, next one. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I'm partial to the CPSS because it's Dr. Foa's measure and I, I had to use that for so many um, years. So I do like it because it, also because it's free. And all you have to do is email the folks at Penn, they'll send it to you. A lot of places, if you look up these um, measures, if you don't have to pay for them and they're just available by the developer, these developers will share. They want to, they want people to use their measures and they're not asking for money. So unless they're on like a Pearson or something like that, you just have to email them and they will send it to you. And a lot of times they'll, they'll not only send it to you, but they'll send you the scoring, they'll send you the, the way you ask the questions. Um, and any sort of research that supports it um, in case you need that information. Um, the CAPS is one used by the VA that's endorsed by the VA. The, um, that's um, available on that um, PTSD Center website online. So again, just you, all you have to do is say that you're a clinician, you work with kids, and you want to you know, be able to screen for PTSD and trauma exposure, and these things will be sent to you. Um, the child dissociative checklist, that's a good one because a lot of times we have kids that do dissociate mm -hmm. um, and we might identify it as not being able to cap pay attention, but a lot of times they're just like, they're kind of going into a protective mode. And so um, it has really user-friendly ways of asking those questions so that kids can, um, you want to give the kids the language mm -hmm. for it. Mm -hmm. And again, I love the fact that there's so many tools because it normalizes it. That it makes it clear that, you know, um, this is not just something that happens just to you. 
It happens to so many kids that they had to make a form for it, and this is what we have to help you. Um, next, I think there's one more group of them, yeah. Um, so some of these ones that are good, you have to pay for. The ones at the bottom are two of those. These are really good ones, the trauma symptom checklist, but you have to pay for it, so maybe EBHC, I don't know. I don't know anyone here that holds purse strings in the room, but you know, <laughs> knock on you know people's doors and demand it. Um, but it's a really the trauma sensitive checklist is a really good one, and it's used in a lot of research studies for trauma. Um, so you know, I like that one as well. Um, attributions for maltreatment interview. Again, the, some of these capture the the um, symptoms of trauma that we don't typically see on a standard, like a more traditional PTSD measure, because maltreatment and neglect are not always included, but those are actually much more um, telling of um, a child that has that trajectory of potentially having more problems as an adult, is the, tr the neglect and the maltreatment. <clears throat> um, so kids that are left alone, kids that are not given proper medical care, you know, we, it makes sense, right, because as adults then they have a lot of medical issues. So we have to remember to ask about those kinds of questions as well from our from caregivers. And if we if we get parents in or caregivers in that are maybe a resource parent or a kinship care, um, it's good to find out how much they know about the birth family and the circumstances around how they acquired um, custody for that child. Um, and then some other ones that are kind of on the peripheral there, the child behavior checklist. It's just a good global assessment. A lot of people use that. It can go from like one and a half all the way up to 18. Um, again, that's one you gotta, you know, pay for. Um, um, and then um, the parenting stress index. This is one that I just kind of recently became interested in. We're working on some stuff about how we can capture um, what what the parents' issues are and what they're bringing into the therapy that we could help them on. And a lot of times when parents are under a lot of stress, it's very difficult to be, um, you know, the parent they want to be. And it's so interesting how many parents say, I really want to be a good parent. I just have so much going on. I have so much stress. There's, there's this going on. There's that going on. Um, and it really it weighs on them. And then they end up being the parent they don't want to be. And so, But it's good to be able to capture specifically what that is. If you um, have an index of some kind, you can zero in on certain um, key areas of concern. And that can be the focus of your treatment. So screening and assessment, to me, just makes treatment easier. I actually don't know how anyone can, can do clinical work without it because it's such a great guide and I always go back I think it's good to go back and say hey remember we did that thing the first time you came in okay we've been meeting for eight sessions can we go back and do it again and the way I say it to people is that I feel like I feel very deferential to my clients because you know I I'm honored that they would even bother to come and see me to deal with these problems I'm all in their business I'm a stranger and so I say you know you should be getting what you want so this will tell me if A, I'm doing my job, and if I'm not, then where are we, where are we stuck? And I think people, people like that, the idea that you care about whether or not they're getting what they want out of treatment. Because if you went to your doctor because you had um, cancer, and you have to get chemotherapy, but they never checked your body again for cancer, ever, ever again, you would look at your doctor like they were crazy. You'd say, you know, hey, um, going to see if this is tumor still there. Are we going to check and see if it's still there? My hair is falling out. I've gone through all of this pain and you're not even going to check to make sure I'm okay. So I always go back and do these again. I try to do it at least, um, you know, every few sessions just to see how we're doing. Um, and then you want to, if you have any measures that can look at resilience, this is like a growing interest in the field about um, protective factors. And I know DCPMP um, really looks at protective factors. Um, they want to build on that and capitalize on that. Um, you want to build strength. People that are resilient are less vulnerable to developing mental health disorders. And it's basically just the ability to roll with the punches is basically what resilience is, right? So um, we want to see um, how much resilience our kids have up front, and then we want to build on that. They have to be able to adapt. They have to be able to um, have people they can go to. If they can use humor, if they're funny, if they're artistic. What are the things that they do to cope? Um, those are the things we want to capitalize on. And even on the parent side, you know, what can we do to build the parents' um, abilities to draw that out of their kids and build their resilience? My, my pictures are just not showing up, but I don't know why. But those are just screenshots of the two places I told you about. But the National Child Traumatic Stress Network is like your best friend if you treat these kids. Um, you know, I don't want, I don't like the, you know, people say you shouldn't assume, but look, 
we're in community mental health. We can assume that a lot of the people that are coming through the door, whether they're they're one or whether they're you know 21 or 31 or 51, they're not coming here because nothing happens to them. And most of the time, this population in particular are most likely have at least one trauma, just something some trauma that has occurred in their in their past. Um, so we can't ignore that. We just have to assess for it. It may, it may have happened and it doesn't have anything to do with why they're here, and that's good, but we don't know unless we ask. So we have, we have to ask those questions. Um, so that's all that was at getting at. So you wanna get out in front of it. Um, through early trauma screening, we have a, a, a wonderful opportunity to mitigate the impact of trauma. We have, also have an opportunity when they're in therapy at a young age to show them that therapy doesn't have to be this horrible thing and that they can talk to us, they can ask us questions, that we're gonna be honest with them, and um, that we're not afraid to ask the hard questions. We have to be comfortable saying these words. We can't kinda, you know, dance around, you know, these questions. One thing I like about TFCBT is you teach all the, um, the words for your private parts up front. So within like a few sessions, kids are able to say penis, vagina, and it's not like, you know, your pee pee, oh, your little, your cookie, you know. <laughs> <laughs> got to be direct because these kids need to know so they can say to a teacher whoever someone touch my vagina and they know the words they don't say someone touch my cookie that's very confusing if you're the teacher you're like okay well you know I will take care of that later if it's a cookie but if it's your vagina they're not going to walk away from that um, so we want to teach our kids I can't believe I just said vagina in the middle of a training but um, <laughs> this, this is who I am okay <laughs> so you know, we, can, we have to be, you know, after doing this for so long, you know, and definitely under um, working in my postdoc, you know, I got very comfortable just asking directly about trauma. And some people say, I don't want to talk about that. <clears throat> okay, I understand that. Um, I'm here if you want to. We're doing, the, we're doing these screenings. If you need me, I'll be in this office anytime you're ready. And some people came back later, and some people never came back. Um, but I would think about them, like, I wonder what they were like when they were 15, or I wonder what they were like when they were really young. And so we have a great opportunity when they're little. We can get them and help them and maybe reduce the likelihood that they're going to be back in the adult division within, you know, a decade. Or they're not going to be that kid going into school hurting everybody because they're hurting, you know. Um, and that's like a whole nother lecture, right, about how mental health is really on the, on the forefront now because they want to blame it, blame mental health, and they want to blame us for why this stuff is happening. Um, and that's a whole nother issue. So if we have an opportunity to get them when they're young, and that's that 10 and under crowd, if we can get them when they're really young like that, we have an opportunity there. It's a critical moment for us to do something. And they're so um, adaptable when they're young like that. They want to learn. They want to do better. And so um, we want to capitalize on that. And again, just creating those environments from the front door. We need to train all of our staff to really be friendly and be kind. I mean, you know, you ever walk into an office and the, the receptionist writing and she's like, just sign right there. No eye contact, nothing. Well, if you have a chronic trauma history, um, that can create a little bit of an uncomfortable feeling. It makes you feel unwanted. It may even make you a little angry because you feel like you're not important, you know, and that's how everybody else makes you feel too. So, um, we need to make sure our staff from at all levels and from all you know sides of it um, you know understand that a lot of people coming into our offices have been through something and we want to kind of hold them and create a place where they can feel loved and comfortable and accepted for the time that they're there um, so um, oh, I'm going to read it because um, that last little no 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 the so, one before that I was hoping it was no no that's so weird it's not popping up so the little arrow is pointed away from a box that reads, the body remembers stuff until an event, a sound, a sight, a touch, a word, or a person awakens them. So we can't afford to miss the opportunity to reach the underlying need. It starts with asking the right questions and normalizing the experience for the child. So there's a great um, you know, phrase from, I think it's a book um, from folks up in Boston, it's the body keeps the score. Mm -hmm. and, um, you know, it's a, you know, there's all these, these battles about how you treat trauma, but at the end of the day, we know that, um, you know, sometimes you can walk by someone, they have a scent, and make, remind you of your mom, or remind you of somebody, and you're like, wow, and you're like right back with that person. Mm -hmm. You know, we have to remember that this is all happening, the nonverbals, the stuff that doesn't get said, 
that's all part of the experience in our clinic. So when we're when we're talking about trauma screening, we don't want to just focus on what is out there and what gets put in front of us. We want to focus on underneath the surface. We want to get at that because we don't want to trigger our kids, but we, and we want to understand what's happened to them. And then um, the next slide, which also is missing, I think, the picture, but the final point is basically from the, the National Child Dramatic Stress Network. They have this slide that says, if, if you don't ask, they won't tell, and that's the facts. That's for kids, because a lot of times, like I said, if kids are exposed to chronic trauma, it's just part of life. They're not gonna see it as abnormal. So if you if you don't ask about certain things, they're not gonna share because that's just part of their life. Um, so I wanna thank you for um, the opportunity to come and talk to you all. Um, and I'm hoping that when you get the slides, you'll have all the little pictures, because there's some good stuff on there. But are there any questions or discussion about this? Does it all make sense? So in regards to, mm -hmm. so in regards to treatment, because this is just a, mm -hmm. basically um, assessing mm -hmm. trauma. So in regards to treatment, um, I know we're doing the cognitive behavior therapy. So that's the, the one, I guess that's the one intervention or the one not. Um, to do CBT, to Correct. treat. Um, you know, I think, well, there's people that do all kinds of different um, variations of CBT. So there's TFCBT, there's all kinds of exposure therapies, and there's more um, arts, like expressive arts type of therapy that integrates behavioral um, components. So I think, um, you know, based on what your training is and all that, I think the most important thing with treatment is to kind of get at whatever the underlying need is. So a lot of times these measures will get at that, but then through your treatment, I think you want to definitely target what occurred, if there's a single discrete trauma, but if there's many, then I think the treatment is really built around creating safety, predictability, structure, and that's on the parent side, because a lot of times parents are actually, um, they're exacerbating symptoms that are trauma reactions because they, they don't know how to create that structure. Um, they get really pulled into um, the child's behavior, so I think a lot of it is skill building for caregivers around how to kind of view their child's behavior with that trauma lens and then react in a way that's different that will promote a better <coughs> way of them interacting with their child. Because they tend to like create that pattern of negative interaction because they don't know what to do. Mm -hmm. um, but I think CBT is still considered, you know, it's the, obviously the most well-researched um, treatment options for um, trauma, but there's a lot of other things out there that I think are really helpful too that are maybe more moving more towards like a psychodynamic or mindfulness mm -hmm. type of stuff too. Mm -hmm. But treatment's a good, Diana, I think treatment would be a good, another, another, someone here wants to do it. <laughs> yeah, we're hoping so. There's some good models out there. Any other questions? Kelly, I just want to add too that um, Kelly had mentioned about DCPMP trying to become a little bit more trauma-informed care, that UBHC is, is following in those footsteps as far as having our own systems-wide approach. I don't know if you read Chris Kossoff's email, hope you opened it, with the um, wonderful uh, little video that was kind of like a planting the seed that Robbie and Stephanie Dubin um, worked on to, to get people talking about trauma-informed care. And we have a, an awesome work group right now that has um, UBHC employees that are from, you know, from Newark and from Monmouth Junction and from all, all different um, levels and of our staff as well. We have people on the work for, um, that are in registration, that are um, office managers. So because we understand that it's more than just clinical work, it is the work of like the first interaction that these people come in contact with us is going to set the tone. And as, you know, most of you being clinicians, like, wouldn't you really rather have someone that feels like safe and kind of like this is a good place and you're doing your assessment and all of a sudden you're like, this is a little bit easier. And maybe it's because the way they were welcomed, you know, when they were registering. Mm -hmm. So I did want to just like put that plug in and because we're going to be doing a um, survey across all of UBHC and we really, really need people to respond to that survey because it's going to tell us what our strength and what our weaknesses are. And we're asking people to be honest too because you know, even the self-care component where you said DCPMP had a little bit of right. a, a, that was some place that they needed to improve on. Sometimes at, at certain levels we think we're doing an awesome job with that and then we get the results back saying maybe not so much or maybe we're doing better in some areas than we are. So, um, sorry, I just couldn't miss the opportunity to give the plug. No, no, it's good. That's good. 
please do that survey. So, it's really important. <laughs> and I just wanted, this might be delving a little bit into treatment, but I, I just wanted to clarify too that trauma-informed care isn't like being nice. Yeah. It doesn't mean you have to be like super, like you're not, it's not about being so nice. We, we are nice, hopefully. Um, <laughs> but it's about um, being being structured and kind of creating an environment where you kind of want to create the environment in the office that you want the, the family to create at home. So for example, boundaries is important, right? So you don't want, you want to make sure you set uh, limitations and boundaries and kind of structure and then you stick to that too, so that you're predictable. So my patients know that I'm going to meet with you for the time that we said. And I'm going to stop, I'll, you know, very gently stop at a certain point because this is our this is our protected time, and so they they kind of know that it's not me being mean to say, okay, we're going to stop. But I, I oftentimes when I was supervising some of our um, students and in our the clinic I worked in in Philadelphia, they would let the patient keep talking because they didn't want to stop and they felt badly. Oh, they're talking about something really difficult, um, you know. So I was late with this patient, and then their whole day gets pushed back. You know, I would say part of, you know, part of doing this work is, is creating that structure. We want them to have that in their lives. So when you say, well, this is our time and this is really important, so let's, let's stop here. I'm here if you need me at this time or whatever. You can give me a call. We'll follow up. But I, I, I have to move, you know, move forward or whatever it is. So that's just an example of how um, being trauma-informed isn't just about being, like, all, you know, touchy-feely and you can't tell a patient no or you can't, you know, set limits. It's, it's that, it's, it's being able to be both there with them, but also creating that structure and that stability and um, predictability. They know that's how you are. You're gonna be there when you say you're gonna be there. If you're not gonna be there, you make sure you talk to them and say, hey, I'm sick or whatever, that they're not just gonna show up and you're not around. So there's just those little things about the interaction that has absolutely nothing to do with the clinical work. And we know from research that we do all these fancy treatments, but the therapeutic alliance is the, one of the most predictive parts of treatment outcomes. So um, we want to have that alliance with them and they can count on us. So I just want to add that in, throw that in there. Um, it's, you know, really important too up front. So if there's no other questions, comments, concerns, complaints. Okay. Thank you so much.